Assassin's Creed Syndicate is a game that's filled with repetitive innovation. Now, I know what you're thinking. How can something be both repetitive and innovative at the same time? How can it be both old and new? How can it try something different while doing more of the same? And I hope to demonstrate what I mean by that throughout the course of this video. I think Assassin's Creed Syndicate is a very good game, and I honestly enjoyed most of the time I had with it, but it simply doesn't shake many of the same old, same old that the series has been doing since the very first entry. But at the same time, it also tries multiple things that are different, such as having dual protagonists and trying to tell a much more modern story in a more modern setting. If you have had any interest in playing this game, I recommend that you pause the video, maybe like it or put it in some watch later folder or something so you can find it later, come back to it after you've played it, because I don't want to spoil anything for you if you want to try it all by yourself, so consider this your spoiler warning. This game is honestly good enough to give it a shot. I can recommend it to you right now. If you have it or want to pick it up, I recommend it. It is a good game that you will enjoy, especially if you've enjoyed previous entries in the series. But the point of this video is not a blind thumbs up or a blind thumbs down, but rather to actually look at the intricacies and the inner workings of the plot, the gameplay, all of that and how it ties together, and specifically what needs to happen with the upcoming title, Assassin's Creed Origins, in order for the series to continue moving forward. So as we go through this video, I'm going to discuss the narrative and the gameplay, but once we get to the gameplay, I'm not going to go into much detail with specifically, for instance, the combat systems or the crafting systems, because I don't believe that they're very important in the grand scheme of things, and I will mention what I think of them when we get there, but just know that if you're looking for a detailed analysis of gameplay mechanics, this probably isn't going to be the video for you. We're rather going to be focusing on big picture stuff that tells us what Ubisoft is thinking about its world design, what it's trying to do, and what they're going to need to do moving forward. But with all that said, let's just jump right into it. As always, timestamps are included down below. If you want to jump to a particular section, I recommend you jump down there, see if anything stands out to you in case you are short on time and just want to get to the good stuff. Starting with the narrative of Assassin's Creed Syndicate, it is pretty straightforward. You play as one of two protagonists, either Jacob or Evie Fry, a sibling duo that is set to save London from its corporatist overlords. The head of these evil business tycoons is Crawford Sterrick, who apparently has his fingers in practically every element of London's economy and therefore much of the world economy. He is incredibly wealthy and powerful, and he has his eyes set on the largest office in the land, specifically the throne. Now I'll talk about Crawford Sterrick in just a moment. I don't think he's a very good villain, actually. I know some people are going to disagree with me vehemently on that, but I will just say right now, I think that he's actually a pretty poorly attempted villain. But focusing rather on Jacob and Evie Fry to talk about them for a moment, I actually really, really liked how this played out. When I initially heard that Assassin's Creed Syndicate was going to be employing two protagonists, I thought that's just a terrible, terrible idea, especially because it wasn't exactly clear how it was going to work. Now, once you get your hands on Assassin's Creed Syndicate, it'll become very evident very, very quickly that this isn't a matter of picking a protagonist and then playing with that protagonist throughout the game, sort of like a main menu, choose your path, uh, decision. This is rather something that you can change as you're exploring the world in real time and as you go throughout main quests, you will change between these protagonists as you go through. Think GTA 5 with their three protagonists. Now there's no doubt in my mind that Grand Theft Auto 5 had a major influence on this game. GTA 5 came out two years before Assassin's Creed Syndicate, but it, it has its fingerprints all over this game, both in the world design and in the very fact that there are multiple protagonists that you can switch between and that encourage individual play styles based on which one you happen to be controlling at that given moment. 
We'll talk about this more once we get to the gameplay section, but right now I will say that I actually really like how this plays out, and the fact that these two siblings are very competitive also encourages this very competitive nature within the player as you go through the story missions, where Assassin's Creed Unity encouraged competitive play through its online functionalities against actual people. Assassin's Creed Syndicate simply throws in a trash-talking sequence between Jacob and Eve to get you riled up into doing something. I'm not sure if that was directly intentional or if it's just a happy coincidence that this is an alternative to encourage competitiveness and competitive play, but either way, I thought it worked. And as I said previously, each of these protagonists have their own strengths and weaknesses. Jacob, being a big burly Brit, is very, very prone to quick engagement in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He's going to be rough and tumble. He's going to get in there, get his clothes dirty, and rough some stuff up. And that is to be expected, especially once you hear a couple conversations where he is involved. He's very rash, and he's not afraid to jump to conclusions, whereas Evie is is much more calculated. She takes her time with things and she has much more of the assassin or at least stereotypical assassin credence and attitude. Simply, these two characters tend to water down players into one of two groups, the stealth players and the combat-based players, the ones who like sneaking around and taking half an hour to complete a stealth mission, compared to those who finish it in 30 seconds after getting through there, just running around, beating some people up, and running away. Now, I may be in the minority here, but I tend to play a little bit of both. I was expecting myself to be able to switch between the two pretty easily, but what I actually ended up doing was playing roughly the same way no matter which of the assassins I had enabled. The only difference was that occasionally I wouldn't have equipment equipped that I thought I did, or I wouldn't be able to carry as many throwing knives as I was used to once I switched characters. Little things like that, but on the whole I ended up playing the same way regardless of which character I had enabled and so the only big distinction between these two characters was in cutscenes and during specifically scripted narrative segments. Now as for the game's antagonist, Crawford Sterick, I actually am not a huge fan of his writing and I actually found myself on multiple occasions frustrated that I had to work to take him down because I felt that he was actually probably the best thing for the Londoners that Jacob and Evie Fry and the assassins claimed to be fighting for. As you go throughout the game, you assassinate many people who work with and for Crawford Sterrick, and multiple times on their deathbeds during their final cutscenes, they say things such as, you aren't going to help the Londoners, we actually are what hold the city together, and without us, the city will collapse, and all of these things that they're saying are true, but Jacob and Evie Fry sort of scoff at them and laugh it off as though they're just full of themselves. But it is true, these business tycoons actually do hold the fabric of the city together. They're the ones employing these lower level Londoners. They're the ones putting food on their table. Even if they aren't paying them well or treating them well, they are still the ones that control it. Now I know I may just be reading too much into this and they may have just been looking for a big bad business tycoon to play the role of the antagonist because after all, this is a game set in 1868 London at the very uh, cusp of the industrial revolution and there weren't many people looking out for workers rights or for the little guy and so the assassins uh, choose to take on that role in this game and it's no more than that but for me it was very very frustrating to listen to Crawford Sterrick talk about his vision for the world this is a guy mind you that is able to run as the assassins proclaim proudly as a reason for his awfulness and for his treachery and wickedness he's a man who's able to control most most of the world's enterprises and business elements. He runs a gang, he runs tons of businesses, he employs thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. He's a very powerful, intelligent, and capable man. 
but because he wants to control London, he's therefore evil. Multiple times, Crawford or his henchmen would say something about their plan for humanity or their plan for London and the British Empire, and I would find myself saying, oh yeah, no, that actually probably would be good for these people. Steric and his men are looking to sort of expand the empire and turn a lot of the industrial work over to places like India or outsource it to different areas such as in the Americas, and that seemed to me to be a very reasonable thing and something that the Londoners should be hoping for because it would ultimately bring more wealth to their country and to their town. But because the assassins don't like that idea, it's bad, it's evil, and we have to kill everyone who even ponders it. Now, this hasn't been the first time that this has happened to me while playing an Assassin's Creed game. It actually happens a lot, where in an Assassin's Creed game, they'll be saying that they need to do something for the sake of the people, or for the sake of the little guy, or whatever. And I find myself disagreeing with the inherent premise, and I actually kind of wish that the bad guy would win, because I agree with the bad guy more than with the good guy. Maybe I'm just a bad person for thinking that way, and it is just a video game, but I thought I would voice it, because Crawford Sterick is supposed to be this big bad industrial uh, villain and I actually found myself siding with him much more than I found myself siding with the assassins who were after all going around killing anybody who disagreed with them on the future of London which to me seems much more like the actions of a terrorist group than of a reasonable level-headed organization again it is just a video game but this is just a critique and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't talk about something that is utterly ridiculous at least for a little while so with all of that having been said in essence I actually like Crawford Sterick, and I think he actually probably could have been very good for London, albeit he's a little crazy, especially near the end of the game he does some stuff which I thought was a little bit out of character, but regardless, I didn't think he was a very well written bad guy. Moving on, the story is much more concentrated as you go throughout Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Now, this might not actually be incredibly noticeable when you're playing it. It didn't immediately strike me until I got near the end of the game. But actually, most of Assassin's Creed Syndicate takes place in 1868, whereas most other games in the franchise take place over a decade or more. Now, was this done for a narrative reason or purpose? Well, probably not. It probably was simply a practical one. Around this time in 1868, moving on to, for instance, 1878, a lot was changing around the world and especially in these industrialized areas. Lots of new buildings were being constructed, industry was changing, people were driving different types of vehicles and they were wearing different types of clothes. It would, practically speaking, be a lot more work work to build a London of 1878 and a London of 1868 and then a London of 1885. It's a lot of work. This world was constantly changing and devolving, so it just makes sense that they would focus on one year when everything would practically be the same. However, they don't just stick to 1868. There are also these sort of tears in time that you're able to jump through, at least through the Animus's uh, technology that they offer you. You're able to jump through these tears and access memories of the same ancestors that were taking place around World War I. You get to play as one of the Fry's descendants, and you actually get to meet Winston Churchill, and there are actually multiple missions that you can go through in this time period through this World War One era London. Now, they are a little ham-fisted, and they get a little dry. You just shoot some planes down, and you look at a blimp, and then you run around, and you see people in uniform, and they explain you killing all of these armed soldiers by saying that they're not actually soldiers, they're actually people dressed up pretending to be be soldiers, blah, blah, blah. It's interesting and it's a proof of concept at the very least, showing that if Ubisoft were to desire to go to World War I or World War II, they could do it under the Assassin's Creed title. It could work in theory. Now, the lore gets very, very messy. To be fair, I've done videos discussing this in the past. For instance, Winston Churchill in World War I is sympathetic to the Assassin's cause and even you meet with him 
in Assassin's Creed Syndicate, and he says that if you help him out, then he's going to go, and once he gets back to Parliament, he'll try to convince them to give women the right to vote, blah, 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 my feminism, whatever. But once you get to World War II, he's switched sides and he's sympathetic to the Templar clause to the point where practically every superpower involved in World War II, according to the Assassin's Creed lore, is actually working together and World War II was orchestrated to control the people and perhaps manage populations or industry or whatever it may be. It would be messy, but it could theoretically work and these sequences prove it on a gameplay level. Now, I also want to say that the game tends to be much more lighthearted and not take itself as seriously as some previous entries in the title. They're aware that this is an Assassin's Creed game and that you're going to have some goofy fun. So we might as well give you a gang to play with. You can upgrade them, go around killing random thugs. It doesn't really matter. Ride your cart around. We aren't going to stop you. Just mess around and have a good time. But this isn't always true. And you will hit some roadblocks where all of a sudden something super serious is happening happening, but you aren't exactly sure why, and you aren't sure how you're supposed to respond to those moments because they happen so quickly right after a sort of goofy moment. The transitions between those emotional and lighthearted moments are really, really rough, and I think they could have been polished up. Now, that's just a writing thing, and maybe other people didn't experience it, but I did. Now, the structuring of the narrative is also quite tough because it is split into story missions where there can be large amounts of time between each one. And it can actually become very easy to forget where exactly you are in the story, especially if you work a lot or are going to school and can only play for three to five hours a week. And then you go a week without playing it and then come back to it. It becomes very, very difficult to maintain the same knowledge of where you are in the story of what character are doing what at this given moment and it's true of many many games but it's also true here now I don't actually want to criticize something without offering a solution to it and I actually believe that there is a solution to this problem that has been implemented in another game specifically the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. In The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, there are these segments during load screens when you first pop the game in and start playing it, where it plays through an animation explaining where you are in the main campaign. And it's actually a very, very helpful thing, especially with a game that large that you can go away for a week and then come back to binge it over a weekend and remember exactly where you were, where the main characters in the plot were at a given moment, what they were doing, Doing and what their motivations were and what your goal was in that moment as well. For a game like Assassin's Creed, this could work really well. You could have really goofy, interesting little cartoony animations or sketches that perhaps Evie has drawn explaining where she's going or what they're doing, or even just a letter where you have a voiceover from Jacob or Evie during those load screens as opposed to the running sequences and sort of gymnasiums they throw you in during load screens currently. That could be really, really interesting. And every time you'd load the game back up, you would see exactly where you were and what you were up to. And lastly, I'll say that I really do enjoy the setting and the narrative of Assassin's Creed Syndicate. I think it works really, really well, and I especially like the characters that they give you. Jacob and Evie Fry are very, very sympathetic, empathetic, and they are enjoyable. I enjoyed playing as each one of them. I thought they were interesting, I thought they were funny, and they had interesting characters to the point where I was excited when I got a cutscene with both of them involved in a given moment. Now, you also get full advantage take of the 1868 London setting to the point where you get to meet individuals such as Alexander Graham Bell, Charles Dickens, Karl Marx, Charles Darwin, Florence Nightingale, and even Queen Victoria. And I absolutely love it. These are characters and people that you would never get to see in most other games and you would never get to hear about unless you're watching a documentary or reading a history book. So I really appreciate the chance to see them in one of these settings. And especially once you start interacting with Charles Darwin and Charles Dickens and Alexander Graham Bell, you really get these fun sequences, especially in the main campaign quests, where you get to deal with some characters that are really interesting, funny, and fun and I really enjoyed it. 
Now, some people will criticize Assassin's Creed's uh, narratives and stories for being predictable, for being same old, same old, whatever. And that is very true. That's always going to be true, likely, of this series. If you're playing Assassin's Creed Syndicate, chances are you aren't playing it for the story. You're playing it because it is an Assassin's Creed game, offers a large world for you to explore and have fun in and to kill some people. Sort of lighthearted fun. You shouldn't be playing this game for a deep, interesting narrative that's going to change your life. Now on to the gameplay. Now when we're discussing an open world game such as an Assassin's Creed game or a Grand Theft Auto game or even The Witcher 3 or a Bethesda open world RPG, there is a gameplay loop. A series of activities that are specifically designed to keep the player engaged, repeating those activities, all the while pushing them through the main story or at least towards the main goal of whatever the game might be. In Assassin's Creed Syndicate, this gameplay loop is fairly straightforward. It starts out by asking you to participate in one of several varying mini-missions that typically involve a kidnapping or killing or stealing from some random member of an opposing gang or the Templars. After completing this activity, you then liberate a section of London, and after doing this roughly 50 times, you will be so high level that you will control all of London and all of the story missions will be a walk in the park. Now, thankfully, the game prevents this or at least attempts to prevent you going through all of these burrows one after the other simply by making this process incredibly repetitive to the point where I tried to sit down and do nothing but these burrowed gang missions for two hours straight and I couldn't do it. It was just too monotonous, too tedious. And while the missions did occasionally throw you a loop or a little something different to try, they still were repetitive. For instance, many of these missions will require you to assassinate some person that is a high-ranking member of an opposing gang. Now, in a couple of these missions, you will just be asked to kill them, but sometimes you'll get a challenge that is by no means required, but it is a challenge that you'll get extra XP or money if you were to complete it following these guidelines. And these guidelines typically are fairly straightforward. It's saying, for instance, kill this individual with a throwing knife or kill this person while hanging from a rope or with crates or my personal favorite was when I was going up against a brother sister duo kind of like Jacob and Evie Fry they were heading up this little area this encampment and the challenge was to kill the brother by making the sister kill him so I had to use a berserker dart on the sister to make her go crazy and then kill her own brother and then she dropped dead soon after and that was one of the more memorable and interesting cases of these repetitive missions, but unfortunately those are very few and far between, and in general they are all still the same mission, just with slightly different coats of paint. Now, while doing these missions, you can go on to participate in story missions, which for the most part are interesting and offer some really cool set pieces that are very, very memorable. My favorite actually was very early on in the game when a train derails and Jacob does his best Nathan Drake impression while somehow surviving it. It's a really cool shot, a cool sequence, and something you wouldn't typically see in an Assassin's Creed game. And on the whole, these main quests are interesting enough. They're they're engaging as I said earlier the plot is interesting enough and they give you something to do no matter how jerky and weirdly paced throughout your game time they may be my one major criticism though of these main quests is that they always feel a little distant and never actually try to pull any emotion from you save for a couple rare examples in Assassin's Creed 3 and even Black Flag the game constantly tried to throw you for an emotion loop and get you emotionally connected to whatever activity you were performing. In this game, that simply doesn't happen. In the Jack the Ripper DLC, they get close to doing this by throwing Jacob and Evie for a bit of a loop, but they never go whole hog on it, and in the main game, it's simply non-existent. Now, after you complete these main story missions, you'll sometimes be too low leveled for the next story mission, or you won't have good enough gear to complete the next story mission. So, what do you do? 
Well, you go back to the aforementioned missions that boost your leveling by clearing out burrows. You repeat the process until you can do the next story mission. Now, speaking of leveling, let's talk about that for a minute. Now, most enemies fit on a 1 to 10 scale, excluding bosses, and that level dictates their damage output and their ability to absorb inflicted damage. The higher the level, the harder the opponent. Therefore, in certain areas, there will be enemies that are higher leveled and require you to level up before taking them on. All of this makes sense so far. Now, by performing assassin-like actions, such as air assassinations, by completing the aforementioned missions, players will gain experience. And for every 1,000 experience points gained, players can then go and reward and redeem those points for a skill point. And those skill points are what will actually level up your character. The more skill points you have, the higher the total level for the character. Now this is where you can actually distinguish between Jacob and Evie Fry. Now each of them have three distinct skills at the very tippy top of their skill tree, something that requires four to six skill points each in order to redeem. And these are specialized skills specifically for Jacob and Evie. So Jacob's skills that are unique to him and him alone will usually consist of him having some extra combat ability in hand-to-hand -hand combat that you wouldn't otherwise, whereas Eevee can gain the ability to essentially become completely invisible and silent when she's standing still, forcing you to play much more carefully and sneakily when you have her enabled. Now this all sounds great, fine, and dandy, but the issue comes when you realize that that differentiation is all at the very top of the skill tree, and other than those three points, Jacob and Evie's skill trees are completely identical, which simply means that by the time you get to the end of the game, Jacob and Evie will be very, very similar, if not completely identical in their skills that they have unlocked, and then in the final missions, you're able to unlock those specialized skills, but you will have already become so accustomed to playing a certain way, it won't mean anything. If they had re-kajiggered the skill trees to be completely unique between Jacob and Evie so that they have completely different play styles, they don't share hardly any skills, and you have completely different skill trees and paths that players can take, that would have been very interesting because you would be forced to play the game a different way based on who you had control over. But because they put these special skills at the very top of the skill tree, it means it's too late and you've already learned to play the game a certain way. And so all of that having been said, essentially the game's gameplay loop is pretty simple. You kill people to level up to do a story mission, and then you do that story mission. So you then move on and kill more people to level up to do the next story mission. You do that one and then you repeat the process again and again and again. Now this brings us to what I believe is the big issue with Assassin's Creed Syndicate, and it's been true of multiple Assassin's Creed games in the past, and to be honest, many Ubisoft games in the past, and I believe it's all connected, so bear with me while I try to explain it. The goal of a gameplay loop is to make it so engaging and fun and interesting that the player themselves aren't even aware that they're participating in it or that it exists at all. The problem is that none of Assassin's Creed Syndicate's gameplay loop comes about naturally. You have to enter into a mission, you have to enter into a kidnapping activity or an assassination. None of it just happens while you're exploring the world. It's very tough to just find an activity organically to perform. One of the reasons people found Assassin's Creed Black Flag so much fun and so engaging was that because when you're just sailing around the ocean, you would occasionally come across a, a giant man of war that you needed to take on and try to fight and you didn't seek out that man of war you were just sailing around and then you saw this massive ship that had a bunch of stuff that you could use to upgrade your own ship so you went and you tried to take it on and before you know it you've spent 45 minutes of your life trying to take down that ship and you don't even know what really happened the game didn't force that on you it simply gave you an activity that you could perform in and you started to perform it that's all you really need to do to create an engaging gameplay loop. The problem is Assassin's Creed Syndicate's activities 
are not anywhere near as natural or as fun as that naval combat mechanic that Black Flag had. Furthermore, once you notice this distinction, you'll realize that a lot of the things that Black Flag did differently that so many people enjoyed are not found in Assassin's Creed Syndicate and can be viewed as one of the main issues with Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Black Flag encouraged curiosity and rewarded it when you performed it and enacted it. Whereas Syndicate, if you go around just exploring places, you aren't going to be rewarded. There's rarely anything truly interesting interesting to find. If you consider climbing to the top of tall buildings exploration, then I feel sorry for you. But if you look at games such as Skyrim, or The Witcher 3, or Breath of the Wild, or even Black Flag itself, these are games that gave you a big world to explore. You got to run around, look for things, or not look for things, but you'd still find stuff that was interesting that was valuable, that could actually impact your overall game. But in Assassin's Creed Syndicate, if you run around the map, all you're going to find is new vendors, and you're going to find a few gangs that you might get in a tussle with, but you're not going to find anything truly unique or special. There's some collectibles that seemingly have no impact on the overall game, and that's it. It's a big issue that Ubisoft has been dealing with for a while, simply that a collectible-a-thon is not actually a replacement for an engaging, interesting, and explorable world. Exploring isn't just going around collecting a thousand of this and that items that you have to meticulously search for. It's actually giving you something interesting to find. And there are seeds of this within Syndicate. There's little moments where you're running around and then you see a man reading a, a story book to a bunch of children and they're all engaged ooing and awing and if they could just double down on that you could get into a really interesting loop where people are seeking out interesting characters that come about naturally. Now, I believe that Ashraf Ismail, who is the guy that headed up Black Flag and is heading up Assassin's Creed Origins, is aware of this issue. And in this video I'm about to show you a clip of, he mentions it specifically and says that when they first started designing Assassin's Creed Origins, they set out to fix this issue. So when we started and we were looking at Egypt and how to fill Egypt and put content that's valuable for the player, one of the learnings that we had made from Black Flag was that we had a good sense of exploration, but we should improve the sense of discovery. And discovery meaning that when you go somewhere to explore it, that you actually find things that are meaningful to you as a player, whether that be gameplay meaningful stuff, or narratively, or lore of the world, but it always should be meaningful to the player, that you always feel surprised, rewarded for your efforts. And so that was an, an early intention, and then it was how do you fill a world of this size, of this scope, where we're constantly rewarding that effort of exploration. And this is what we've been doing for the last four years, filling this world. So yes, if you see an entrance to a cave, go inside of it. I guarantee you there's cool stuff in there and surprising stuff as well. You know, the pyramids, the tombs, these were places that we had an opportunity to create a more crafted experience uh, built off of the actual architecture that we know from those locations. Of course, with our own lore, with hidden chambers that have not been found yet. Um, but we found a way to integrate our lore into that. But again, it's a crafted experience that you can just stumble upon, find really amazing hidden stuff, and, and feel rewarded for it. So that was a really important intention to make sure that Egypt really comes to life and that we have our players completely lost in this world for as long as we can have them. And so, in summation, Assassin's Creed Syndicate's gameplay is engaging, it's interesting, it's fun. The combat, I don't think I need to speak to uh, specifically because many people are aware of how lame it is. It's just button mashing, it often falls into the same trap of a big, super overpowered parry button that nerfs everything else and it becomes incredibly easing, easy and boring at the same time. It's just not very good and the fact that a half of your gameplay loop consists of doing nothing but killing people, you would at least hope that that element would be fun, but unfortunately it's really not, especially once you get near the end of the game it just becomes a bit of a chore, which I guess is good because you have Eevee unlocking all of these special abilities that encourage stealth, but in the grand scheme of things it really is just monotonous and not incredibly fun. There's some other mechanics such as crafting I could speak to, but uh, in general they don't offer you anywhere near the amount of fun that I think they were going for.
Now moving on, let's talk a little bit about the technological aspect of Assassin's Creed Syndicate. This game was the follow-up to Assassin's Creed Unity, and it came after Watch Dogs, both of which really freaked out the gaming community to the point where many people were saying, we're never going to get a polished product ever again, we're going to get a microtransaction filled heap of glitches, and that's all we're ever going to get. And people were very skeptical, and rightly so, of Assassin's Creed Syndicate when it launched. However, upon launch, it actually ran pretty well, and in 2017, it is pretty much flawless, especially playing on PC. The game is beautiful, despite some weird overexposure that occurs occasionally. I've noticed this in a few Assassin's Creed games, and it's a little bizarre. I think what they're trying to do is make it look really realistic when you transition between indoors and outdoors. It was really obvious in Assassin's Creed Unity, and it's still there in Assassin's Creed Syndicate. I get what they're trying to do, but for me it was more jarring, going from inside to outside and having this giant white just shine in my face. It was more distracting that I found it realistic or interesting. Now I should also point out the DLC of this game. There was a good amount of DLC released, but the most significant and interesting was the Jack the Ripper DLC, which is set in 1888, 20 years after the main game's events, and in it you join forces with Inspector Frederick Aberline of, or Aberline of Scotland Yard, and you hunt down the serial killer and try to save Jacob Fry. Now it's interesting, it's engaging, if you would like to see a critique on that, just let me know down in the comment section below. Hit the like just so I can see that the interest is there. These videos, of course, take quite a while to make. Now, as I said earlier, this Jack the Ripper DLC actually does dive into some more emotional plot lines and is much more interesting than much of the main quest, at least in my opinion. I won't get into too many spoilers in case we do do that dedicated video to it. But I will just say I really enjoyed it and I would recommend it to you. And this, of course, brings us to the elephant in the room, which is microtransactions. Now, these exist within Assassin's Creed Syndicate. There's no getting around it. They are there. These microtransactions can give you crafting materials, money, and even permanent XP boosts. However, Ubisoft justified this by saying that all of these things can be gained through natural in-game play and you don't need to purchase it in order to acquire it. They said, quote, they want these microtransactions to be there as an option for people who wish to save time on gameplay and accelerate their progress, end quote. Now this should be concerning to anybody who reads that statement, and it just takes a little bit of thought for you to realize why this could be such an issue. Simply, when you're selling an expedited means of gaining experience points and currency and materials, you want to encourage people to buy whatever it is that that might be. And whether that is a vitriolic thing or truly evil and greedy, I won't comment on. It's just natural. If you sell a product, you want people to want to buy that product. It's natural. It makes sense. The issue with games, however, is that when you do that, you end up taking away from the natural experience. Sure, money is still acquirable in Assassin's Creed Syndicate without buying microtransactions, but if you buy microtransactions, it's much, much faster, and you don't have to grind the same way you would otherwise. And that word grind is something you hear a lot when discussing microtransactions. And it's brought up a lot when you talk about microtransactions specifically because when you have a means of expediting it, you want to make sure that naturally it's so slow that you would think about buying the means of expedition. Simply put, I don't like the microtransactions in here. I think it encourages a very grindy MMO style of gameplay where you have to go around doing tons of missions that are very samey and repetitive in order to acquire the same stuff you could if you were to give them a buck or two. It's frustrating for me and it ends up dragging out the experience. And this brings us to the most important section of the video, which is Assassin's Creed Syndicate's lasting impact on the series. What good would this video be if we didn't talk about the elephant in the room, which is, of course, Assassin's Creed Origins, which is set to release October 27th of this year. Now, as I said earlier, and in that short clip from the video I showed you of Ashraf Ismail, the game director of Assassin's Creed Origins and Black Flag, 
the development teams behind Origins seems to be very aware of the issues that have plagued Assassin's Creed games prior. This is the same team that brought us Black Flag, which is, in many people's minds, the best game in the franchise. And when they're talking and doing these press events talking about Assassin's Creed, they seem to point out these very issues that are so obvious in Assassin's Creed Syndicate, in Assassin's Creed 3, in Assassin's Creed Unity, throughout the entire franchise they are aware of it and they are working to fix it in this following game now do I think Assassin's Creed Origins will be the perfect game and will blow everyone away I'll be praising it higher than I praise The Witcher 3 well no I don't think it's gonna be that good but I think it certainly has the potential to be very very good especially even moving forward the best Assassin's Creed out there because it's looking at games like Syndicate that did a lot of stuff well and a lot of stuff right but just came short in many other ways to make it so it was a good game game but not exceptional. If Ubisoft can look at Syndicate and say, you know what, we messed up on these little portions, we dragged this out, these segments weren't very interesting, blah blah blah, then they could release a game that is truly surprising, engaging, and interesting for everybody who plays it. But if they stick to their same old ways of doing things, putting out the bare minimum, trying to create a game that's just good enough for the public, then it will fail horribly, and possibly even end the Assassin's Creed franchise. But to end on a good note, I really did enjoy my time with Assassin's Creed Syndicate. I really, really did. And perhaps it's just the setting, perhaps it's just the music and the original soundtrack, which I believe is so good that I even play it most weeks on my podcast, Talk Gaming. I really, really enjoyed my time with it. Does that mean that it's perfect? No. Does that mean that it's a truly great game? Perhaps not. But it is good, it's engaging, it's interesting, and for an Assassin's Creed game, game it is well above average now even if this game had just launched and we were just a week out from release and I was recommending whether or not you should buy this game I would actually say go for it this was a game that I really enjoyed and that you can easily get 20 plus hours out of and I always tend to break things down to cost per hour of entertainment movies are pretty low on the list because you're paying 10 bucks for an hour and a half or two hours whereas a video game you can pay 60 bucks for 20 40 60 80 hours of entertainment and that seems like a no-brainer to me and with Assassin's Creed Syndicate you're looking at roughly 60 dollars for a game that's going to take you well over 25 to 30 hours to fully complete. But as always, whether or not you enjoy these games is going to be highly contingent on whether or not you enjoy the setting and the time period in which they're set. If you enjoyed the French Revolution and found that really interesting and that time period really engaging and magical, then of course you're going to enjoy Assassin's Creed Unity more than you would perhaps Assassin's Creed 3. However, if you enjoyed, for instance, the Industrial Revolution and London, then this is obviously the game for you. It's pretty straightforward. If the game is interesting to you, I recommend that you pick it up and give it a shot. But if it's not, it's not, and that's perfectly fine. These videos, however, are geared much more towards the people that like talking about games, that really like picking them apart and seeing what works, what doesn't, what's good, and what's bad about certain games, and how games can take lessons and note from others and learn from them moving forward. Syndicate is a very good Assassin's Creed game, although it didn't connect with me on any sort of emotional or spiritual level such as a game like The Witcher 3 or Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. But that's about all I have to say. I'm really interested in hearing your feedback, so if you could leave that down in the comment section below, I would greatly appreciate it. And if you want to talk to me, you can join our Discord server or follow me on Twitter, all of which is linked down below. I also decide which games to critique and cover by looking at the comment section of these videos. So if you have a video that you would also like to see or a game you would like to see critiqued, make sure to leave that down below as well. Overall, I would just like to say thank you for sitting through this long video. I know it takes focus and the fact that anybody would be interested in listening to me talk for more than 10 seconds is frankly amazing. And so truly and honestly, I say thank you.